to welcome uh, all of you tonight. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, we have a number of uh, empty seats because we have a, uh, a number of coaches, um, uh, members of corporations in the and uh, academia who are attending a meeting, but they will join us shortly. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I, I just wanted to, 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 to thank you uh, 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 for education, uh, for this initiative, and, and uh, Kathy Kemper. Um, also, uh, I know that uh, I have no merit whatsoever in organizing this. Uh, Rosa, uh, well, it is in the language of business. Rosa, Rosa is the vice president at, at the embassy, so uh, <laughs> she was uh, in charge of uh, organizing this meeting. But, I, I believe that we have a, a, a very interesting um, audience, which are very high quality people. Uh, and to that, tonight, tonight I want to thank uh, in particular uh, all of those who decided to associate ourselves with, uh, with this. And um, I have to thank Tampo um, Farmer uh, and Phil and, and Peter Evans for, for joining us. Uh, well, about the mini seminar. Um, when, uh, but, uh, Minister Moreno Silva uh, came to Washington. Uh, he was invited by the Secretary of Energy, Mr. Morris. Uh, he had a number of interesting meetings uh, starting very, very early this morning, so I don't know how he can survive uh, <laughs> all, 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 all the whole day. He's traveling to California. There is a, a business mission uh, associated with also with the Minister's visit. And so um, we are very fortunate to have you uh, tonight with us, and uh, very happy to have you. Uh, it's good to be friends, and, uh, and to have also you have to know about Mr. Moreno Silva that there is, he is a, a very unusual combination because uh, that shows you how Portugal is uh, progressing uh, a lot because he's the minister in charge of both the environment and energy, among other things, because he has other jobs to do. <laughs> And uh, also, um, I should underline uh, that uh, he's the deputy chairman of the Social Democratic Party, the main party in the coalition, the chairman is the prime minister himself. Uh, and before that, um, I, I should mention, because I would be remiss if I wouldn't do that, that uh, he served in, in the European Parliament, uh, not responsible for the low uh, number of voters in the last election. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you were a member, a candidate again, uh, the number of voters would be higher. Uh, but um, the, uh, the, the, the <coughs> served in at the UNDP, at the United Nations, uh, uh, European Investment Bank, uh, and uh, in, for, uh, for many years, uh, in particular linked to, uh, with all the issues that have to, have, have to do with the environment, uh, with climate change, and uh, I believe that you had a, a very important role also in uh, drafting the, the directive, the European directive on, 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 on the on the uh, trade. And uh, so, uh, if you want to reel someone uh, on these issues, uh, you uh, well, you can try that. But of course, as an ambassador, I have to protect my minister. So if there is some question that he cannot address, I will try to do that. And before I shut up, I just want to say also that. that um, um, for Portugal, uh, this is a very interesting moment. Uh, we have just left, I don't know how familiar you with, uh, with Portugal you are, or so do you, but we have just left um, a so called uh, adjustment economic program uh, that was agreed with, 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 with the European Central Bank, the IMF, and the European Commission. We have, been, uh, we have done that on, on shadow uh, successfully. Um, and I think that we are back to the market uh, and back uh, to our feet uh, as a normal country. Uh, so we have a very long history, but I, I believe that the, our future history will be better than uh, the, the one that we have to face alongside the other European countries in the last few years. So, once again, thank you very much for coming. We'll join, uh, uh, we will be joined by other participants in our meeting later on, and I hope that we have a nice evening and uh, uh, a nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I She deserves also a round of applause. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Two, two.
Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador and Rosa, the DCM. Thank you for your generous hospitality. You two are like the power couple in Washington, D.C., the ambassador and the deputy chief of mission. <laughs> or so you call the vice president, right? <laughs> yes. So as I always say, welcome sport fans, welcome sport fans to our Institute for Education Info Public Policy Salon. Hey, Scott and Kimberly, welcome. Salon evening. Um, this evening, wherever I be is civility and collaboration prevail. We are now in our 23rd season and IFB and our infos have been recognizing and promoting civility and collaboration in the world community. For over two decades, we have been breaking through partisanship, cutting through politics, and bringing leaders together, like these all, to establish common ground. And in doing so, we have always been leaning in, looking to the next big thing, like tonight, energy. Energy is what it's all about. Cutting edge energy innovation. Thank you to the minister, De Silva, to Peter Evans, and to Matthew Thiel, our distinguished panelists. You all join a very distinguished group of 270 speakers over 23 years, including a Nobel Prize winner, cabinet secretaries, a White House uh, <coughs> vice president, a uh, chief of staff, governors, mayors, senators, an FBI CIA director, <laughs> Judge William Webster, an IFE steward right there, a professional athlete, and five Supreme Court justices. There's no doubt that IFE Info is an insider opinion leaders Washington institution, a mainstay of the Washington public policy arena. I want to welcome our extraordinary and plenipotentiary ambassadors with here tonight. I want to uh, do a shout out to our IFE leadership that is here. Uh, Jim Valentine, sitting right over there, an IFE trustee, also my husband, founder <laughs> of the And Institute remember, of we had a Miss America as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he liked that one. <laughs> he had a front row seat for that one. <laughs> uh, um, Marcy Robinson, chairman of our board of stewards. Stand up and say hello, Marcy, please. Thank you. And Dr. Amy Ging, our IFE innovation steward. Dr. Amy Ging, thank you. Um, you can also recognize a few of the White House Innovation Presidential Fellows that are here. They have little pins. We have Scott Wu and Jeff Mulligan here and Matthew Thiel and a couple other ones I think are coming later on. Um, they are uh, uh, very distinguished and um, are finishing up their round two uh, at the White House, their tour of duty. We want to thank you for your great work and your contribution <coughs> to the United States. Um, Amy's husband, who is Todd Park, the United States Chief Technology Officer, he has a great way to talk about the guy, these guys. He calls them the badasses of the badasses. And I love that <laughs> saying. And what's the new one he said today? Um, compounded awesomeness. Compounded <laughs> awesomeness. Not bad. And so thanks to our members and our distinguished <coughs> moderator here this evening, John Paul Farmer. He is the Institute for Education's Emerging Market Roundtable founder. He is now the Director of Technology and Civic Innovation at Microsoft, just left the White House a few months ago, and is a longtime Institute for Education supporter. We have Joanne Key back there uh, from the World Bank. Thank you, Joanne, for your support. Joanne is also an IFE fellow. And we have Tom Patton right here. Thank you, Tom, for your support. And Steve Taylor there, the United Way. Thank you, Steve, very much. Now, you all have a program, so take a look at it. It gives you the bio of our distinguished panelists. And um, with that, I think I will have John Farmer uh, introduce the panelists, and we'll get on the way. Uh, Coach, it's been fantastic being involved with the Institute for Education over the years. Thank you for your leadership, and thank you for your team, all the fellows and interns that make nights like this possible, and of course, the staff here at the residence as well. So with that, I will just uh, tell a very brief story, because uh, my current job, I'm at Microsoft, uh, doing civic innovation, it touches energy, but it's not exclusively about energy. So you might wonder why I'm up here uh, speaking to these very distinguished uh, experts on this topic. And a few years ago, about five years ago, I was actually at a point in my life where I was uh, I was investing um, and managing an energy portfolio, focused on alternative energy. And I was thinking about going and actually starting that uh, a 
new business, doing a startup, and making that my full-time thing. A couple of weeks after I started having these discussions, um, I got a call from the administration asking if I wanted to come down and work on healthcare reform. So I, I quickly shifted gears from energy to healthcare, and uh, and the rest is history. Otherwise, I might uh, I might not be here today. And from there, I got to work with uh, the aforementioned Todd Park in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and um, and worked on a number of these issues from uh, from uh, disaster response from recoveries and other things that uh, in, in which energy is such a crucial component. Uh, and then I ended up in my current role. And what's exciting is that I, keep, I get to keep working on these same issues. And, uh, and I get to collaborate across sectors with folks who are in government, at the local level, the federal level, and internationally, as, long as, as well as folks in the private sector. So uh, with that, let's pass it on to the folks who actually know a lot more about the topic, the folks who are really here to, to listen to and learn from. And uh, to start with, directly to my left, we have uh, Minister uh, Georges Moreira da Silva. And as you heard, he is the Minister of Environment and Energy for Portugal, and I don't think anything more needs to be said. So with that, I will pass it along to the Minister to give uh, some opening remarks. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Institute for Education, the, our Ambassador, the Deputy Ambassador, and distinguished guest for uh, this possibility to share with you some thoughts concerning the Portuguese uh, energy uh, um, policy in this very important moment. We are really in a time where <coughs> on both sides of, of the Atlantic we are taking very important decisions. Uh, the timetable is very important and we should work together in order to coordinate this, uh, these debates. Uh, we cannot miss this uh, uh, opportunity. You know that uh, uh, in the US you are taking very important decisions on uh, climate change uh, and we are uh, still seeing the impact of the energy revolution in the US and its impact not only domestically but also uh, abroad and in Europe we must agree by October on uh, climate and energy uh, the 2030 framework so by October Europe uh, will not only have to fulfill our targets already adopted uh, uh, on legislation uh, until 2020, but we will uh, uh, have to adopt new targets by 2030, uh, which is a very important uh, uh, debate, and Portugal has been uh, very active uh, in order to make sure that we are not just taking uh, a, a small element of the picture, which is uh, uh, sustainability, but we are also addressing uh, cost effectiveness. We are also uh, uh, taking decisions on uh, energy security. And as you know, at the same time, uh, uh, we are also facing important discussions concerning our dependence from Russia. Uh, Europe, and that's not the case of Portugal. Uh, I will bring the Portuguese case uh, immediately after this remark. Uh, Europe depends on 40% from uh, uh, the gas imports from Russia, 80% uh, of that through Ukraine. So suddenly, the debate <coughs> with Portugal and Spain were pushing in Europe concerning interconnection, the idea <coughs> of having a more interconnected Europe with the transmission on electricity, but also on gas, in order to de decrease the cost and to provide security of supply became uh, a top issue. It was an Iberian Peninsula issue and it emerged as a European issue. So suddenly we are looking to climate and energy policies, renewable energy, energy efficiency, but also uh, looking to options to be taken in a very short time concerning energy security. Well, what's about Portugal on this picture? Uh, Portugal was uh, a country that by, 20, uh, by 2005 were dependent on uh, uh, energy from imports uh, from abroad on 90%. Uh, we focused on, in the last decade, uh, on uh, uh, renewable energy. And now uh, 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 we are a champion on renewable energy. We are the country in Europe with the third largest, most important target on uh, uh, renewable energy. 60% of our electricity uh, uh, is uh, uh, results from renewable energy. 
and you may ask, well, uh, did you hesitate about uh, this space, uh, uh, this commitment, uh, because you were facing an uh, economic and financial crisis? Did you undermine this uh, commitment because of the cuts, or uh, did you uh, uh, manage the cuts at the same time that you kept the uh, ambitions? And the answer is the second. Uh, we decided, and th that was not an easy uh, uh, answer, we decided to reduce uh, uh, excessive rents, uh, uh, excessive costs uh, on the energy sector without undermining our targets. Because we knew that both for uh, energy security reasons, but also for uh, uh, innovation, R&D, uh, eco economy and jobs creation, we would need to keep the renewable energy sector as uh, <coughs> an important goal. And now, uh, you may ask, well, well, now you achieve these targets, uh, what are you looking for for the future, for the 2030 uh, targets? We think that Portugal should uh, give a step forward, not just uh, fulfilling very ambitious targets, national targets, but position itself as a, a renewable energy provider to Europe. Uh, Portugal uh, is uh, blessed by resources like uh, wind, uh, solar, uh, waves, uh, hydro, uh, in a quality and quantity that offers a unique opportunity to Portugal to attract investment, to export renewable energy in order to make uh, our uh, uh, member states, uh, 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 European uh, uh, colleagues, uh, in, in order to achieve their own targets in a uh, uh, less uh, costly way. Why? They will have important targets, challenging targets, but they can achieve it because the uh, European legislation allows it through the import of renewable energy from Portugal. Where's the answer? It's interconnections. We depend very much on interconnections in Europe. Interconnections are vital to provide, it's the internet of energy, uh, who are vital to provide cost efficiency, to provide security supply, to provide uh, uh, low cost decarbonization. And the second element of this, and I'm concluding, it's the LNG, because the same answer applies to another problem, which is the, the natural gas. Uh, you may not know, but uh, because it's something that just emerged very uh, recently, that 7 out of 12 uh, LNG uh, uh, terminals in Europe are in the Iberian Peninsula. We just have 12 uh, uh, LNG terminals, and se 7 out of these are in the Iberian Peninsula. So we are presenting uh, uh, the case, Portugal and Spain, which is if Europe wants to reduce its imports from Russia without new investments on <coughs> LNG terminals, but with additional investment on interconnections, we are able to replace 40% through Iberian Peninsula of the, the, the energy imports, of the gas imports from Russia. And one of the terminals, the Portuguese terminal, can replace 7%. Why, why am I mentioning this? because this is an interesting debate uh, uh, to be taken at the same time that you are holding debates on uh, the US concerning the, the export. Of course, uh, 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 we miss something, and I'm, I'm sorry for uh, taking the phone. You, you gave me four minutes, I guess, or you five minutes. Like 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 no, but <laughs> I'm, I'm concluding. Uh, uh, you may also ask, well, you invest on <coughs> renewable energy, uh, it was useful. You are asking for new targets for Europe and for Portugal on, on renewable energy. And what's about your energy dependence? It's true that that's the big problem. We, in spite of the role of renewable energy on electricity, which was great, we, we have great companies, great R&D centers, uh, uh, we are still uh, uh, dependent on uh, uh, the use of oil or, or transportation. Uh, and uh, uh, even having very good companies on oil and gas distribution, uh, of course we would need to replace uh, some of these uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, resources by the resources that we hold, which are wind, water, uh, solar, <coughs> and, uh, and uh, waves. 
So we are uh, uh, launching a new program on uh, electrical vehicles. We think that it's the next big thing for a country like Portugal. Um, we started being the, the, the ones that implemented very soon uh, uh, wind energy uh, equipments. And uh, after that, we are now exporting 80% of all the equipment, so blades, towers, that we are manufacturing in Portugal. And we think that, well, if in the electrical vehicles we start uh, uh, presenting this as a priority as users, sooner or later, I'm confident that it's sooner, we will be in a place where uh, uh, we can also export this uh, technology. That's why we are very uh, 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 interested in, in, in attracting investment, attracting R&D centers, uh, also from the US, and uh, we have a commitment. The public administration should give an example, and we are replacing half of our fleet by 2020 for electrical vehicles and, uh, and plug-in. I think this could be, uh, uh, this could provide the, the level playing field to uh, uh, those that are manufacturing, doing research, look to a country that is small uh, in terms of uh, 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 territory, but we keep the idea of being uh, a, a country which you will identify when you are trying to address green growth. So Portugal will be there, and I'm quite confident about this. So thank you, I'm sorry for taking the floor. For that <coughs> was an excellent overview, Mr. Minister. Thank you so much. And I love when things just work out, because you made my job very easy. <laughs> because our, our next panelist, I think, is going to touch on some of the topics that you just raised, things around, uh, you mentioned the, the internet of energy, and, and connectivity, and uh, interdependence. And uh, next up, we're going to have Dr. Peter Evans. Uh, Peter is the Vice President at the Center for Global Enterprise, and CGE was founded recently by Sam Palmasano, the longtime chairman and CEO of IBM. And uh, prior to this, Peter had a, a long career in energy uh, at GE for a number of years. Um, he has a PhD from MIT, and he also has international experience, having worked in Japan for a couple of years. So with that, Peter, uh, feel free to, uh, to give folks a, a better understanding of the work that you've done and your perspective on things. Thank you very much. It's fabulous to be here and to share some observations. Um, <clears throat> I've been looking at the energy space for about 30 years now. My family built two small hydroelectric power plants in 1980 and 1981 as a direct result of the oil shocks mm -hmm. and uh, programs that the uh, U.S. government instituted at that time, actually the Carter administration, to promote uh, indigenous energy. And um, so I'm not very opinionated about many things, but <clears throat> I've been in the energy space long enough to have formed some observations, and that's what I'd like to share with you tonight. Um, and one is that I think that there's a lot of analytic leverage or, or value in thinking about energy as a network industry and how those networks interconnect. And you don't often hear that in the discourse. It's, always, it's often a discussion about supply and demand or products. How do we innovate around products, things, widgets? But the reality is that those products and things sit within the context of networks. And over time, the, the ways in which these networks have evolved is very interesting. And so what I'd like to talk about, or at least raise these questions, and we can discuss them further, is, is what does it mean to innovate in the energy space today, given the fact that we live in an age of networks? And I'm going to talk more about the U.S. because I've got some data here that I pulled together. Um, <clears throat> you often hear the narrative, and in Washington it's very popular, to talk about how the United States is falling apart and the infrastructure is falling apart, da 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 da, -da. But the reality is, is that when you actually dig into it, the United States is a network superpower. We've got the biggest road network that exists in the world. We've got an amazing rail infrastructure. We have an amazing gas pipeline infrastructure. We have an amazing electric grid infrastructure. We have an amazing telecommunications infrastructure. And then on top of that, we have built an internet infrastructure that tons of innovation is now taking place. So <clears throat> I could read these numbers. I've put together a little PowerPoint. This is the uh, legacy of working for GE. They live in PowerPoint, so <laughs> I can't do anything without PowerPoint these days. Um, but when you think about networks and the density of networks, it um, gets you thinking in a different way about innovation. It's not necessarily products, 
but it's how those networks interconnect or don't interconnect. And you find that actually governments often fall down on thinking about the network aspects, or they just look at one aspect of the network rather than the interconnectivity between the networks. And we're facing that actually right now in the United States. There's been this renaissance in gas because of the cheap supply from uh, the shale renovation uh, innovations. Um, and that's leading to a lot more consumption on electricity using gas to generate electricity. And suddenly there's a coordination problem between the gas pipeline and how it's dispatched gas and how the electricity system is dispatched. And so there's a lot of work being done to figure out how to make these two systems work together better. But there's actually even more profound things that are happening. One is that we have this rail network um, and the gas pipeline network, which were two separate networks that had nothing to do with each other. But now the rail industry is like, wow, we want to use some of that cheap <coughs> gas and use it to power the locomotives that do long haul freight. How do these networks interrelate and interconnect? Um, and so now they're doing lots of studies about the linkages between the rail networks and the gas pipeline networks to understand where there could be fueling stations to power um, vehicles. And then when you speak about electric vehicles, you're suddenly talking about how the road transportation system interconnects with the, uh, <coughs> the electric power grid system. And so suddenly you begin to think about how these uh, networks should or do not uh, interconnect. And then you've got the internet, which is unleashing this whole focus on big data, big data analytics, and how does that network interconnect or not interconnect well with these other networks. So um, in advanced countries, um, you tend to have richer, denser networks. The situation today with Russia is actually very different than it would have been 30 years ago. There was one pipeline, was the Yamal pipeline. Lots of interesting history about that one pipeline. Today we have an incredibly dense, rich network uh, that interlinks all sorts of countries in the region, Caspian region plus Russia, with Europe. And so people raise the alarm about dependency, but actually there's lots of ways to interconnect and get around uh, cutoff uh, points. But adding new capacity, which is linking into the international network of LNG supply, creates more robustness in the system. So the question is, how do you harness those interconnections and uh, make them to drive? The, the other point I wanted to make is, is that <coughs> it's not all about sustainability. The, the world is increasingly facing shock events. Um, and the numbers of shock events are increasing. And that's largely due to the fact that the human built environment is much larger. So we have a lot more infrastructure, a lot more bigger cities. And so when these natural things happen, they tend to do more damage. Right? So the, the first Lisbon, the big Lisbon earthquake that took place in what, 16, no, 14, 17, 17, 17 yeah. You know, it was, it was dramatic for Europe, but just imagine if it happened today. There's a lot more at stake, right, that could happen. Um, data that uh, NOAA puts out, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they have that, there have been since 1980, a total of 144 natural disasters in the United States that have done more than a billion dollars worth of damage. If you tally that up, that's a trillion dollars. And quite a bit of that has damaged energy infrastructure. And I go back to my network interconnections. Hurricane Sandy, it knocked out the power grid. What did it happen? It cascaded into the liquid fuel supply system because electricity is what is used to pump the gasoline. <coughs> and so suddenly you had one infrastructure cascading damage into another infrastructure and paralyzing both. And so the interrelationship between networks can both be beneficial, you create synergies and value, but it also can create cas potential for cascading failures. So that leads me to the final observation, which is where should governments focus their attention? And there's a lot of focus on sustainability. How do you create, build out a green, clean energy system? But on the other hand, when these shock events happen, suddenly, particularly when they happen in particular communities, there's huge political pressure and demands to create robust systems, systems that <coughs> understand those or bounce back very quickly. And that gets you into the whole discussion about resilience. So I would leave you with the thought of how do we harness for innovation in these networks and not only promote sustainability, but also the robustness of those systems 
so that we achieve what I call RSI, Resilient Sustainable Infrastructure for the Future. And then the question becomes, are the public policy programs that our governments are promoting, are they achieving that? And the reality is, is that in my view, there's a heavy, heavy emphasis on the sustainable side, which is very important, but there isn't as much on the, the resilience side. So how can we shift the dialogue and the um, types of programs to be able to achieve both so that we're achieving and promoting, at least from the government standpoint, um, because the private sector tends to underinvest in resilience. How do we promote technologies that achieve both sustainability and resilience? Thank you, Peter. Uh, and thank you so much for proving me right when I said that you were going to build on the minister's remarks. You <laughs> told me that. I do that, so I was following your marching orders. So next up, we have, uh, we have Matt Thiel. And Matt is a Presidential Innovation Fellow. He was recruited by the White House, and he has been embedded in the Department of Energy doing a tour of duty for the last year, and he's about to wrap up that tour of duty. Now, full disclosure, I was one of the folks who recruited him. So I feel invested and very, very actually very pleased by the success that he's had. But prior to this, Matt had a long career in the private sector. Um, at Intel and elsewhere, he has been on the board of uh, SGIP, Smart Grid Interoperability Panel. He has also been the president of two smart grid organizations. So uh, Matt has had a fantastic variety of experiences. I don't, I don't think there are many people in the country who have the kind of perspective on the energy sector that Matt Thiel does. So with that, take it away. Okay, well, I'm not sure I can live up to that. Uh, but first of all, thank you very much to uh, Coach Kemper and Amy Gang and Elise for um, asking me to speak here tonight. I think it's uh, really an exciting time in the energy uh, innovation area. Uh, probably the most uh, interesting, exciting time since really Tesla and Edison competed to define the electricity standard back in the 1800s. So if we look around the energy industry at some of the innovation that's taking place, um, uh, Peter mentioned uh, a lot about uh, networking and networking energy. Uh, we see this global build out now of smart grid taking place across the world really. Uh, in the United States, SGIP, like John mentioned just a few minutes ago, is in the process of harmonizing standards to allow re-architecting the grid to address a lot of these issues that were mentioned by the previous panels here. Shock events, fault error and detection, being able to reroute electricity in the event of a hurricane uh, or some other disastrous event that takes place. Uh, so there's a global sort of re-architecting the grid that's taking place really for the first time in the last 120 years or longer. Uh, in other areas we've seen uh, in the United States and in other places this massive push towards renewable energy also. Um, we see that in Portugal, as the minister pointed out, but we also see that in the U.S. and that's being driven by a number of different factors. We've seen um, innovation taking place in the manufacturing sector for solar panels. We've seen uh, innovation taking place uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, just the technology involved in building solar panels. We've also seen higher volumes than ever as renewable energy starts to get embraced. So, for example, in the last three years or so, since 2011, the price of a solar panel has declined by 60%. So as prices continue to decline, more and more people find solar energy appealing and they start to increase their use of solar panels, which keeps driving and driving higher and higher volumes and lower and lower prices, which makes it more and more exciting. Um, other areas that are very interesting in the energy industries, we've seen a lot of companies in the battery technology space. Uh, there's a startup by the name of Ambry Technologies in Cambridge, Massachusetts that was spun out of MIT recently. It's completely innovating uh, on the battery front. We've seen fuel cell manufacturers starting to uh, come up with uh, incredible innovations on the fuel cell market, which is making it interesting uh, to people as well. Uh, on the biofuel side, there are amazing uh, sort of innovations that are taking place there as well. Uh, Amy Yang told me recently, three weeks ago or so, she went to Paris on vacation. Um, uh, what Amy may or may not have seen is that there is a company by the name of Origin Oil, uh, along with its sort of partner, a French company, uh, by the name of Enesis, which is a crowdsourcing company, uh, that are building an algae farm on top of a building uh, in La Defense, uh, the commercial and banking sort of center of Paris right now. So the, the goal of that algae farm and what they're doing there is to build an algae farm that's capable of converting that energy into fuel capable of meeting the building's needs that it's on the top of. 
So they're actually building algae and producing the energy that that building needs. It's just amazing sort of innovations that are taking place uh, across the world. Um, all of this uh, sort of changes that are happening uh, in the innovation area uh, is driving all kinds of new business opportunities. So smart grid, where they're starting to add AMI meters, AMR meters, they're starting to add fault detection equipment, they're starting to add sensors to light poles and to other things, are starting to produce massive amounts of data and information that people are starting to look at and they're starting to realize there's a real business opportunity here in the energy space that didn't exist a year ago or five years ago or 20 years ago. And so you see companies like Splunk, which maybe some of you are familiar with, uh, which really takes uh, <coughs> massive amounts of data in the machine-to-machine -machine area and uh, pulls out the most salient, the most interesting and important information out of that and makes it available to managers to be able to use that information to make important and critical decisions. So in, in essence, what they do, uh, what Splunk does is they make chaos out of massive amounts of data. And so, um, so they're able to sort of control the chaos and pull off the information that's really valuable. Uh, those companies that were involved in sort of the machine to machine area are starting to come into the energy area also um, and really start to uh, make fortunes and to add a lot of value. So Splunk had a market capitalization last time I looked over $5 billion uh, just by taking massive amounts of data and pulling out important pieces of it. Um, but with all the opportunity that's starting to exist, uh, because of the innovation that's taking place across the energy area. There's also a lot of risk. There's a lot of risk for uh, companies and organizations and others that fail to innovate during this time. So as I mentioned, in the renewable area, we're starting to see this massive race towards people starting to embrace solar energy across the world, really. Um, this presents a lot of risk for, for example, utilities in the United States and other places. Uh, as more and more customers find solar energy um, easily accessible, uh, cheap, uh, good for the environment and having a lot of other benefits and they start to invest in solar, utilities that are locked into a lot of fixed costs, uh, fixed costs, things like coal plants, nuclear power plants, they can't get rid of those fixed costs but they're starting to see less and less revenue as more and more of their customer base shifts over to renewable energy. So for those utilities that are not embracing solar, uh, they're really in what some analysts in the industry uh, call the, the spiral of death. This basically locked and fixed cost where their customers are starting to abandon them for cheaper, better, uh, climate-friendly uh, innovations that are taking place. And they're at risk really of being in, a, in serious uh, financial peril as a result over the next couple of years. A lot of other innovations that we can talk about uh, in uh, the solar industry, renewable industry, the electric vehicle industry. Uh, but that's just a quick snapshot of some of the things that are taking, <coughs> taking place across the horizon. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Thank you all so much for the opening remarks. I'd like to start by taking advantage of the diversity of experience and perspectives that we have here uh, by asking a very broad question. And that is, what do you believe is the appropriate role of government in the energy sector? Because inevitably, in Portugal, in the United States, elsewhere, Governments play a role. They play a role through regulation, through taxation, through incentives. Uh, in the case of the Department of Energy in the United States, opening up government data as fuel for innovation. So what's the appropriate role? And feel free to tie it to, uh, to, to real world examples, if you like. Well, if you allow me, uh, I would speak with the, with, the, with the experience of being in the, in the national government, but also as a former legislator at the European level as former MEP. Uh, and energy, uh, uh, it's on the on the time frame of investments and, and, and impact of regulation. It's very different from other sectors. Uh, you must provide uh, predictability uh, on the on investments, and uh, uh, the government has a role. Uh, it doesn't mean that the government has to implement the project, but the government has an important role. Uh, I would say that there is a set of uh, requirements, uh, not just one, but a set of requirements that, that must be fulfilled. First, you must provide uh, 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 targets, uh, clear targets, uh, if you are talking about climate change or energy or energy efficiency or renewable energy, it's important to set uh, targets and not just short term but also uh, longer term targets to ensure 
in a in a in an area where you cannot provide just public finance because it's impossible to to, to allocate uh, a huge amount of public finance in a sector which requires a, a major transformation. At least you must provide this predictability, which is targets. Second, you should foster cost-effective mechanisms. Uh, it's important to have. A level playing field to make sure that companies, where they take decisions on investment, uh, uh, either as a producer or as a consumer, that they can benefit from uh, market-based mechanisms or uh, uh, other taxation uh, mechanisms uh, that will uh, uh, provide the cost effectiveness of the, of the schemes. Third, it's important to ensure an energy mix. I know that it's a, a quite controversial the idea of uh, uh, having technology neutrality or trying to design uh, the uh, supply uh, 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 mix. But I think that if you look at least for the renewable energy sector, that it's important not to put all your eggs <coughs> in the same basket. Uh, 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 the, the countries that has done that in the past uh, uh, did fail. The countries that, uh, at least on renewable energy, those countries that uh, 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 address it comprehensive set of technologies uh, benefit from being on early stage uh, on some of these developments, but not totally dependent on one uh, technology. Uh, it's also uh, important the public procurement. Even if the state is not able to invest everything that is needed, at least it can set standards, it can uh, 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 provide <coughs> the, the clear uh, 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 final that is important for the technology. Final, finally, it's important to have the price side. It's uh, not just cost effective mechanisms, but to ensure that uh, uh, you are able to internalize all the external things. Uh, that's why Portugal now is uh, holding an important debate on the uh, uh, green taxation reform. Uh, our citizens are facing uh, well, through the crisis we were obliged to address a long set of policies and one of the policies was the increase on the labor taxation and corporate taxation. Uh, uh, we are doing our best to, through the public sector reform and through growth, to be able to, uh, in order to fulfill our uh, uh, debt, uh, our deficit targets, uh, uh, to have uh, the chance of reducing the, the taxation. But we have an alternative uh, 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 debate, which is even without being able to reduce the labor tax, the, the overall taxation, are you able to, under neutrality approach, to uh, uh, create a new balance between uh, uh, green taxation, labor taxation, and corporate taxation? And in our opinion, uh, that this could be an interesting debate in order to uh, protect labor and companies through the, uh, the, uh, this reform which can foster eco-innovation uh, and R&D uh, uh, incentives. So the, the, the it's a long uh, answer to a, a very important question, but I think that we should, we must address a set of uh, policies that, uh, uh, from the public sector and the government and not uh, uh, a silver bullet. Excellent, very, very comprehensive. Um, so Matt and Peter, thoughts on that? Uh, Additional comments? Anything that, that, that wasn't covered? Because well, I mean, there's a foundational, and when you're building out networks, for example, um, because people outside the energy sector fail to appreciate the stakes that are involved. These are, and often, particularly for anchor projects, they can be multi billions of dollars. So, what governments can often do is help build trust amongst the parties, and when it's an international deal, you need the trust between two different legal <laughs> sovereign entities, right? Um, and so it's very important to have diplomacy to be able to facilitate the trust in uh, international arenas. Um, the other is coordination. Um, sometimes the private sector um, has opportunities, but it's hard for them to coordinate. I'll give you a concrete example that's happening right now. The rail industry has done a lot of studies to see how the gas networks intersect with the pipeline networks uh, in the United States. But they've realized that if they build the liquefaction to fuel them themselves, it'll be more expensive 
than if they, they cooperated with the trucking industry and the inland shipping industry to co-site these facilities so that they can all use them. But the trucking industry and the rail industry are actually quasi-competitors, mm -hmm. um, and so they're not likely to be together in the room unless you put them together in the room um, and point out. So governments can actually be great facilitators of the larger national interest by bringing parties together in the private sector that otherwise wouldn't, and then help resolve some of the coordination problems. So, so I would agree with uh, both of those comments, and in addition, give sort of my own example, SGIP, Smart Grid Interoperability Panel that I was on the board of directors of uh, from 2009 until I took this Presidential Innovation Fellowship. Um, the government decided that they really wanted to accelerate the adoption of Smart Grid across the country. Uh, and so government has this ability to convene everybody together in a way that's really not possible by an industry trade group or by other people in any kind of uh, rapid fashion if you want to make uh, forward progress. I also agree it uh, gives us a level of trust uh, and reliability to get all the partners into the same room. So for example, with SGIP that was founded in November of 2009, uh, by the end of 2012 had gone to almost 800 member companies uh, that were participating. So there were work groups or people defining specs, there were people just accelerating things in a way that would have taken 10 years in most uh, trade groups that I've never seen. Uh, governments also have the ability to award loans, they have the ability to provide grants to accelerate uh, adoption, they have the ability to uh, provide favorable tax environment uh, in a way that the private industry doesn't. So there are a lot of other areas that the government can really uh, take a leading role in terms of convening people, but also create an environment which uh, helps accelerate um, innovation in a way that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Excellent. So when we look back at uh, at, at recent decades, and we think about the energy sector that each of us has today in our various countries globally. The energy sector is uh, an accumulation of all those past decisions. Uh, Todd talked earlier about compound awesomeness. Well, maybe these aren't all awesome decisions, but it is the compounding effect that brings us to where we are today. So what would you say are the keystones, those most crucial decisions that either have been made in the past or that we could make today, the things that would really change the direction of our energy sectors, of, of the cost, of the public benefit, of the safety, of all the issues that people care about. Should we take a stab? Absolutely. Go for it. You know, actually, when you look back in history, there are seminal energy-related events that have had a powerful impact in defining those decades. So if you go back to the 1970s, it was the oil shocks. And the oil shocks had tremendous implications, not only for the energy sector, but for other sectors. Um, I would say the 80s was really about deregulation. So it was the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, but it was really an effort to drive efficiency in the energy sector. The energy sector had gotten fat and bloated and not as efficient as it could have been. So the question is, how do you institute competition? And so lots of discussions about how to drive efficiency um, and economic efficiency in the system. And then the most recent decade, I would say, would be climate and how you deal with the uh, externalities associated with uh, fossil fuel generation. So I think energy has been front and center of shaping um, some of the key things that we grapple with um, internationally and domestically. So um, just my comments on this would be, historically the energy industry hasn't really been a place of rapid innovation, right? The electric grid that's in place today has been there for 100 years, more or less, in, in generally the same state. Um, there haven't been a lot of sort of major events that have driven innovation over uh, over time. But I think a lot of that is changing now. So with the technological innovation that I talked about earlier, with the advent of the internet, um, with a lot of the other changes that are happening, coupled with climate change and a growing population, um, there's this, not only this need for innovation and change, but a requirement. Um, in the span of my lifetime, the population of the world will have gone from about 3 billion people to 9 billion people in one lifetime. And what does that mean? So that means there's more cars, means that there's more airplanes, there's more houses, there's more gadgets, there's more factories producing all of this stuff that is creating pollution, is creating environmental change, it's reducing the polar caps, it's making all these changes. So we're at a point where technology is allowing us to innovate in the energy area in a way that we've never been possible, has never been possible before. But we're also in an environment where we have to innovate if we want to address a lot of the major issues that address humanity. Well, I would like to 
to, to, to add something which, in my opinion, made uh, a difference in Europe, which was to avoid fragmentation, mm. to provide integration, which was the cap and trade scheme. You can uh, 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 argue if the scheme is perfect or not. It is not. Uh, I can tell it because I was the, 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 the one that was uh, the being responsible. Katarina remembers she was at the parliament also at that time, uh, responsible for the final draft of the, of the bill. Uh, but uh, we know that uh, uh, even uh, if, if it is uh, required to, to improve the, the scheme, that with the scheme we empower the companies to take their own decisions. Uh, at that time, the, the debate was uh, quite difficult because we decided to join Kyoto, to ratify Kyoto, uh, to implement it, that the question was about the costs. Uh, and we were hesitating in Europe about taxation or a cap and trade, a trade scheme. The advantage at that time, I don't want to talk in the national politics and, and obviously not in the US, but at that time in Europe, the, the debate uh, 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 provided this solution, which was cap and trade. I think it was uh, important. Why? Because we empowered the, the companies. We, we were no longer taking, at the national level, uh, uh, decisions on the caps. There was a European cap. Uh, 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 and the uh, allocation of this cap directly to the companies, uh, which are 11,000 companies. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, with the, the, this step, uh, 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 we were uh, able to uh, uh, make sure that we are not uh, uh, designing uh, innovation science policies uh, 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 at the European level. We were just providing the right incentive towards the carbonization at the lowest cost. And after that, it's the market that uh, provided the best uh, solutions. So the question is, what should we do in the future? Uh, and I think the answer is uh, integration. It's not fragmentation. I hope that one day we will be able to have uh, a global carbon price that that uh, in that time we'll be able to replace the subsidies for renewables, for example. We still need subsidies for renewables, of course, because th there is no price signal, even at European level, that will be able to uh, 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 replace the subsidies. But if we provide a global current market, regional, being linked uh, uh, with other regions, uh, uh, this will create a level playing field that would be interesting. So it's uh, the, 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 the an element that I think was uh, important when looking to the past, uh, uh, a critical moment, I think, on the at European level was the cap and trade. Excellent. We have covered uh, so much already, and I've got so many questions I could ask. I will uh, restrain myself to only ask one more question before opening it up to folks here in the room. Um, so my final question <coughs> would be uh, climate-related events and disasters are increasing in severity. And we've seen that here in the United States with Katrina and with Sandy. Uh, we're seeing it all around the world. And I know at Microsoft, we're very interested in, in figuring out how we can use technology better, how we can use data more effectively as people uh, plan for and respond to disasters. So I'd love to hear from each of you uh, thinking about the impacts that disasters are having on on the energy grids, um, and what can be done, what should be done now to make us more resilient than we're already doing. Start. resilience. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's a ton of stuff in this space, and I think it's going to get more attention, and we'll need to get more attention. Most people aren't aware, but um, when Hurricane Sandy hit. It knocked out the central grid and affected, I think, nine states. Um, but it also knocked out all the solar. Why did that happen? Well, solar is actually grid tied. And so when the central grid goes down, the solar went down. So here you had policy that was promoting green, but it wasn't robust. So some areas that are interesting, the other was LEED certified buildings. 
you want green buildings, you want more energy efficient buildings. Those buildings were flooded just like other buildings in Manhattan and they went down as well. So they were green, but not robust. So I think there's some interesting areas where you could look at, and this is I think uh, an important role for government, is, is to try to drive innovation in how do you build network systems that um, are robust or recover quickly from a shock. And um, there's lots of interesting ways in which data can be used to harness um, information um, and better allocate resources during a disaster. So there's really interesting innovations uh, in that space. Um, but it's also going to take changes in infrastructure. So you're going to need to identify what are your critical facilities like hospitals, um, government buildings, it could be military installations, <coughs> and then create some level of redundancy in the system to support them. So CHP technology is one example. Um, and then I think there's a lot of work to be done as to what kind of redundancy you want to build and how to promote innovation and low cost <coughs> redundancy in the system. And there's really very, very little work in that area because um, and you mentioned, we're going to go to 9 billion people. That takes a lot of infrastructure to support it. Um, and it creates more vulnerabilities. And in fact, if you do a city analysis, it's really interesting because they, we know a lot about where the earthquakes are likely to happen. We know which cities are vulnerable to hurricanes. We know which cities are vulnerable to tornadoes and other events. Um, and so putting together the right systems, there's a lot of analysis that can be done to understand what is our current system, and then what do we need to invest to promote um, a robust uh, system going forward? So anyway, it's a rich area that both the private sector and the governments are going to need to join forces to be uh, successful. Um, what I would add to that is, you know, I think that the smart grid will uh, help us in some ways with many of the uh, climate changes and other things that are, um, that are taking place now. As I mentioned earlier, uh, many parts of the grid will have fault detection. They'll have other ways of being able to understand for the first time if a pole goes down, where that pole went down exactly and reroute the electricity mm -hmm. around it so entire neighborhoods don't go out, which is the current model right now. If somebody drives down the street and unfortunately run into a uh, 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 power uh, you know, electric pole, uh, the entire neighborhood or entire city will go down as a result of it. So smart grid will help us address some of that. Uh, so that's part of the solution, I think. Part of the solution, though, is we're not going to be able to reduce the number of hurricane events or other sort of natural disasters that are taking place. In fact, um, statistics and data would suggest otherwise that it's going to increase over time. So we have to do more to harden the grid um, and do things like grid resiliency, where we take into account when we build uh, the electric grid and we build these other uh, uh, parts of the grid to harden them for these types of events right front, knowing that they're going to increase uh, over time. Um, so those are just a couple of other things, but I'm sure the minister would like to add some more. Well, uh, I think one of, one of the, the answers would be to mainstream uh, climate change adaptation on the special planning uh, work. Uh, as you know, we were all very focused on mitigation mm -hmm. uh, and re on controlling and reducing emissions. And adaptation was, for many, many years, just an issue that was on the agenda for the international negotiations because developing countries were putting that as a precondition to accept uh, legally binding uh, uh, schemes. Now it's no longer the case. Uh, the US is very active debating adaptation. And also in Europe, Portugal, for example, is unfortunately, uh, uh, like Spain, uh, one of the countries that is likely to be uh, uh, very much affected by, by climate change in the next decade. It's not in two or three decades, it's the next decade. Uh, uh, we will face uh, more events on severe droughts and, and cost degradation. For example, last winter, uh, it was <coughs> terrible. We, we were, we were uh, very much affected by, the, by some damages. And, and suddenly, it emerged at the special planning debates uh, the uh, adaptation to climate change. Uh, so I think that the first uh, answer is it's this. It's not about technology. It's not about uh, 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 well, energy policy. It's uh, about special planning and uh, the capacity to mainstream climate change within the, the, this, uh, this uh, uh, design. The second is concerning uh, the, the, the 
the infrastructures and, and the degree of uh, in interconnections. There is a, uh, an important debate now in, in Europe and that some split, some countries like Portugal are asking for more interconnections, also for security of supply, and other countries think that it's better to have capacity mechanisms, which means that uh, in order to have redundant uh, uh, and more resilience, you will need to invest more in capacity to make sure that you have all the capacity installed to all the demand that you can forecast. Uh, some of the countries are uh, asking for that, and that means that you will still have some islands uh, on, on, on energy, like the Iberian Peninsula is now. And other countries like Portugal think that you should uh, invest more in interconnections and less on uh, 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 redundancy and on capacity. Uh, and it's a cost uh, assessment uh, analysis that must be uh, done, and it's uh, important to, to do it, taking concern the climate change events and, uh, and the, the risk of, of, uh, uh, of losing the capacity to provide <coughs> the public service. Excellent. So with that, let's, let's open it up to folks in the room. Who, uh, who has a question they would like to ask? Uh, Jan, what would you like to ask? I have a question for the Minister about your electric car interest. <coughs> How many cars are you talking about? And are you talking to Tesla and other manufacturers about making this happen? Well, concerning the public uh, administration sector, mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about replacing around 10,000 uh, uh, vehicles from now to 2020. Uh, and it's one uh, uh, part of the strategy. The first part was having a public network of uh, plug-in chargers, which are in place in 38 uh, municipalities. Uh, now we changed that uh, approach, making sure that we will not only <coughs> enlarge such, such, such network, but we will uh, promote the capacity to plug-in at home, at workplace, and for example at the malls. Uh, and the third element is the public sector leading by example. Because I think that behind the problems related to electrical vehicles, there is a, a, a not just an infrastructure and a price problem, which is quite clear, but also a cultural uh, 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 problem. Many people uh, in Portugal and, and, in, and in Europe, I don't know about the, the US, if that's the case, uh, uh, consider that uh, the electrical vehicles uh, are now, even if it is a plug-in, which has uh, the capacity to combine uh, the thermal uh, with the, 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 the plug-in, uh, consider that it's uh, 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 something that you use like a gadget, not as a, an option, not as a solution. And we need to prove that it's possible to live with the, the these electrical vehicles with plug-in, and that's why the public administration can provide uh, 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 this side. Obviously, I hope that with this picture, uh, I will be able to attract investment, and I'm visiting Tesla tomorrow. So, I, uh, <laughs> so it was a very important question. I'm, I'm visiting Tesla, like I'm visiting many other manufacturers, to uh, tell them, if you want to find a country where to invest, to put a factory in order to uh, expand your activities, uh, uh, benefiting from this uh, uh, political side of what Portugal may be uh, good, good idea. Well said. That, that chicken and the egg problem is always such a big deal. It sounds like Portugal is actively addressing it. Yeah, so one, one other thing. First, I applaud uh, sort of the, the focus on electric vehicles in uh, Portugal, and I, I really respect what they're doing. Um, I'd like to see um, more of that happening in the United States. Um, this is one of the areas that I think we really could uh, make tremendous strides in a short period of time if we can get the industry to come together uh, collectively in a way that we did with the smart grid with electric vehicles uh, specifically as part of that. Um, I don't know if anybody knows, um, in 1908 when Henry Ford first came up with the Model T without Googling it, does anybody know how many miles per gallon the Model T got? You, and you're, you already know what I told you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> that's the <laughs> person <laughs> willing to venture. Yes, go ahead. Let's, let's ask one more. Gary, do you have a question? Oh, sure. But 
Uh, it wasn't about the. I, please give me the answer to that. The answer, the answer is about 25 miles per gallon, right? Mm -hmm. So in 1908, miles uh, the Model T got about 25 miles per gallon. If you look at the average miles per gallon of a car on the road last year, at the end of 2013, it was about 24.9 miles per gallon. So uh, we really haven't made a lot of progress in the last 105 years or so. But electric vehicles and getting the industry to sort of push in that direction to get the kind of mileage that we see out of the electric yeah. vehicles today, I think would uh, provide a tremendous amount of benefit for everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I guess mine's between a question and a statement, but there's a uh, really interesting discussion about innovation, technology, grids, uh, interconnectivity, all kinds of things, resilience, which is going to um, help us uh, increase on the supply side, but nobody has talked about demand and how do you reduce demand, and that seems to be the most simple and obvious thing to do, you know? How do you start getting people to switch off lights and take public transport and all the rest of that? And nobody seems to be approaching that in a systematic, um, you know, organized way through education, through public policy, through, um, and it seems like, you know, how much can you, it just reminded me of, uh, a uh, device that Conservation International said um, very proudly that they put out in Nepal, they have a stove which reduces the amount of fuel that you use by 30%, hallelujah, but the population has just increased by 70%, so you end up with a net net loss. So it's that kind of thing which I, you know, which you, you talked about, you talked about population explosion, but I'm also thinking about, I don't think there's enough focus I'm just getting people, you're assuming people are going to carry on with life as usual. And to get them to understand that no, it can't be as usual. That's all. Um, I actually have a whole other presentation I can give on energy efficiency. Is it on PowerPoint? Yes, it is. But I actually think there's a tremendous, and it goes back to your data point, that there are new ways of capturing. One of the reasons energy efficiency is hard because you know, buildings, for example, are black boxes. And so there's lots of ways you can actually collect data about buildings now and then link them to vendors that have solutions to them that are extremely exciting. So there are a bunch of platform companies and I'm actually putting together a session on platform companies in the energy space. And one of the companies I spoke to yesterday who's gonna be on the panel is a company called Retro Efficiency. And they serve their clients as a utility to help them identify using big data analytics. Um, almost, it's almost like the healthcare model of, you know, the cost of healthcare is actually borne largely by a few groups of people that the, they're the biggest contributor to that rising healthcare cost. It's the same with real buildings. If you look across a city like New York, it's actually a couple of them that are really out of shape. And if you can help the utilities identify which those buildings are through doing that data analytics, then you can pinpoint the interventions. And so one of the promises of big data analytics is, is that you know where to intervene more precisely yeah. and exactly what the problem is. So there's a lot of interesting yeah. things happening in that space. Yeah, so it's about behavioral change. No yes. one is really looking at and No matter how much you put technology, in, you'll have another building that will come up and another building. So I'm thinking no one's really tackling behavioral change. Yeah, and, and part of that behavioral change, I think, um, part of the reason why there hasn't been this behavioral change is a lot of people just don't even know what, how much energy they're using. Yes. Right? So uh, one of the things people like Nick Sinai have done in the last few years that is uh, compounded awesomeness, right, is uh, <laughs> driving things like the Green Button Initiative so that there's a single standard regardless of where you are in the country and you're able to, for the first time, be able to understand how much energy you use on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, on a week-to-week -week basis, when you know how much energy you're using, now you're in a position you can start to make real change. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to do that if you don't have that ability to start with. But I would jump back to one point, which is the, the world is moving to a greater and greater urbanization, and it turns out that urban dwellers use less energy than rural dwellers. And so we're actually going to see, at least on a per capita basis, actually people using less energy because the populations move to cities. And so that leads to the question of how do you give cities to operate in such a way that they reduce their overall energy consumption. And you're finding with companies like Uber, um, you know, the whole share economy idea, which is better asset utilization based on the data analytics that allow you to um, better optimize the use of those assets. 
I mean, our cars sit in garages all day or in the parking lot of where we work. There's new ways of networking those cars and getting them to the people who and need them. To, and getting them to use more fuel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> more efficient. <laughs> you well, I think that is a that is a great question and, and great thoughts to end on. And before we thank the panel, I'd like to recognize Saku Ri, you sound Saku? Yeah, Saku. And Jeff <laughs> Mulligan <laughs> over here. These are two of our innovation fellows. And then we have to the last year working on uh, cyber physical systems, the Internet of Things. And today, just a few hours ago at the Washington Convention Center, they convened hundreds of people, dozens of companies, 1,200 people, uh, wow. 24 unique projects that are impacting people in real ways. And you can actually touch and feel and kick the tires. It was an amazing day. And what they've done is going to continue on for a long time. So I just want to thank them for everything they did last year. Give them a big hand. Yay. So with that, our panelists, uh, Minister uh, Nora De Silva, Peter, Matt, thank you so much for your comments. Thank you so much uh, to the ambassador and, and his wife for their tremendous hospitality. And uh, in the spirit of being here at the Portuguese re re residence, uh, I will say, uh, uh, Boa noite. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, John. Now, before you walk it up, because I know all the Americans are super hungry, you know, because of the money on these uh, Latin schedules. But we have um, some, some thank yous to, to give to uh, our, our special guest. Um, to the minister, we have cufflings from the White House Oval Office. And they're authentic. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. We have the same for you. So you can wear those cufflinks. The DCM, Deputy Chief of Mission, who is a great cook and teaches me all about Portuguese um, culture, we have for you a White House apron. <laughs> So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you panel. Um, uh, this is very educational, erudite, and um, uh, we can all now enjoy wonderful Portuguese food and wine, correct?